water's coming in hot. Plenty of rain is continuing to fall. November 2021. Look at this bridge. There's nothing left of it. 30 days worth of rain. Just pulled the neighbor's fence down. It's the farmland of Canada's west coast in just 48 hours. This was completely evacuated last night. Leaving behind a trail of destruction. Now, a day later, the storm moves inland to the arid interior. A region completely unprepared for the onslaught. Come on, Maggie! These small rivers flood fast. It's really hard for people to prepare. That's a major. No road left. The entire province had every major highway shut down. 20 rainfall records were set. Now communities must fight to build back. Here at BC's underwater. Oh, they're four new homes. And to defend against the next disaster before it happens. Vancouver, Canada, in the Pacific Northwest. Here it rains 160 days a year. Rain clouds come and go. Is that not crazy? But in November 2021, something more powerful is brewing. Wow. Oh my God, that's lawn chairs. A storm so intense, it promises to dump more rain in two days than the city would see in a month. We are seeing very trusty weather models predicting over 200 millimeters of rainfall. It's a nightmare scenario. Saturday the 13th, it hits. The first of several atmospheric rivers forecast for the south coast has now arrived. Now the rain's really started to pick up. It'll continue to be heavy at times a significant amount of rain, and it's all courtesy of this atmospheric river. Just three hours northeast in Merritt, BC, it's a different picture. Here in the Nicola Valley, it's dry and desert-like. We have very different types of weather in the interior. We have much drier weather. We have drier snow. No one expects the storm's impact to reach this far. <laughs> Four years ago, Dylan Bullock moved to Merritt, lured by the rugged terrain of nearby mountains. Man has a ton of mountain biking, fishing, hunting. It's definitely a growing community. The location lined up with a job fighting wildfires. I ended up getting that crew leader job. I actually decided I really like it here. I really like the people that I worked with and kind of fell in love with the Nicola Valley. In the summer of 2021, five months before the storm, here it is, the heat dome from space. It brought us our all-time Canadian temperature record. Dylan and all of British Columbia's wildfire crews are on high alert. He was like 49 with like 60 km an hour wind. Just insane fire conditions, like something completely unprecedented. We were breaking records by five degrees. And with that extreme heat comes the risk of fires. Look at the sky behind me. This is no filter. This is what it looks like right now. Upwards of 40 new starts as a result of lightning in these very dry, warm, and windy conditions. A very challenging situation developing here in southern British Columbia. These fires were starting to expand quite rapidly. In late June, west of Merritt, one rapidly moving fire bears down on a community where Dylan had once lived and worked himself. The village of Lytton, British Columbia, has been devastated in a fast-moving wildfire. In fact, we're hearing that upwards of 90% of the structures in the village have been lost. Word reaches Dylan's crew, busy fighting another fire to the north. Finding out that Lytton had burned down it was really sad. 
Dylan Summer will only get worse. We were working a wildfire, and it was chewing up ground pretty quick, and we're trying to even just figure out where we can get a foothold. But the flames shift too quickly, turning on Dylan. I ended up getting fairly serious burns to about 15% of my body. My left arm, my neck, and my chest. My two skin graft surgeries and a month in the hospital. Three months later, with his girlfriend Maria by his side, Dylan heads back to Merritt to work on his recovery. And through everything that he's been through, you can't help but fall in love with him more through his resiliency. She had kind of said, like, oh, would you want to move in with me? So, yeah, really looking forward to just kind of, like, starting our, our lives together. By Sunday, November 14th, parts of BC have been hit with 15 centimeters, smashing rainfall records. Here's the copious amounts of moisture that's all courtesy of that atmospheric river stretching into the Fraser Valley. We could see that number storm total up to 150 millimeters. With the storm about to push inland. Can we fly a little bit low over that? Just to the top of it then? Carrie Ann Lau sees the recent fire damage as a serious risk. So I get really worried when I see lots of rainfall warnings happen, one after another. After a fire, soil becomes hydrophobic, repelling water. The soil only has a limited capacity to absorb that moisture before it has to push it off into the rivers and the streams that surround it. With unprecedented rainfall hitting high elevations, this could spell trouble for those in the river valley below. Up the Nicola Valley is Spence's Bridge, a small town connected to Merritt by Highway 8. Rain is rare in the desert-like landscape. We get very few rain. 300 days of blue skies, we like to say. And you get the landscapes of hoodoos and cactus. Stephen Rice runs a small cafe in town. He knows all the locals. Americana Mista, ready to go. And meets most of the visitors who pass through. We actually have more bighorn sheep that live in Spence's Bridge than we do people, by quite a margin, by the way. It's exactly the kind of place. So beautiful. Kim Cardinal and her husband, Lorne, yeah. hope to spend their retirement when they bought a hobby farm just off the highway. Hello, Ella. We just wanted out of the city life and wanted to show the grandkids a better way of life. Hi, babies. The place offers lots of room for their animals, including her favorite horse, Winter. Always oh, make mommy happy, don't you? Hmm? Yeah. Winter and Kim bonded when she rescued him three years ago. He was in a bad situation. So I took him and brought him back to health. Kim's big property also comes with a view of the Nicola River. The back of our house is about 10 feet from the bank. We purchased a place off an elderly man. And the first thing I asked him was, the river, has it ever flooded the property? He had lived there for 43 years. And he said, no, it has never come over. The deluge is now bearing down on the Cascade Mountains, towering over the Nicola Valley. What I always worry about with atmospheric river events is how much rain is falling in the mountain. It's pulling on this cumulative effect of all of the snow that's fallen up until then in the season. There's a rapid melt going on, and all of that is running downhill into the valleys like Merritt.
at Barrett's Wastewater Plant, Chief Operator Kevin Vilak is eyeing the two rising rivers right outside his door. The plants located at the lowest elevation within the city of Merritt due to the fact that the sanitary sewer system which brings the wastewater to the treatment plant is a gravity-fed system. If the rivers get too high, the plant will be underwater. I logged into the wastewater treatment plant and started monitoring the flows so that the plant wouldn't flood. Wastewater would contaminate drinking water and spill over into the streets. City officials raise the alarm. The amount of water coming through is absolutely unprecedented and the gauges just aren't designed to handle it. But not everyone is getting the message. As a late 20s, early 30s person, I don't know how many people are just watching cable news or listening to FM radio. No, we're watching Netflix. I'm not thinking like, oh, we should check the weather report. And Dylan's got even more to distract him. This weekend, Maria has just moved in. Everything was just scattered all over the ground. But then the Sunday, it was raining. Uh, it was kind of a moody day. So then we decided we were like, we're going to make gingerbread cookies. <laughs> It sounds like it's raining pretty significantly. That was kind of the last that I thought before I fell asleep. As dawn approaches, the rivers are raging. At 4 o'clock in the morning, my phone rang, and it was our utility supervisor. I had to get into work right away. As I arrived into the yard, there was four inches of water running through it. The equalization tank starting to overflow. The plant can no longer process sewage. Kevin needs to shut it down completely or risk long-term damage. The first location we wanted to protect is our motor control center. If the water got into that room and shorted things out, then we would be dead in the water. Just a few blocks away, Dylan and Maria still have no idea there's a disaster on their doorstep. Uh, I wake up, I hear like this weird bubbling sound. It's not the same as the raindrops outside the window. I swing my feet over the bed into the water. It is freezing cold. I remember seeing the light of the lamp. It's shining off of the water that's in the room, and I don't understand why there's water in the room. At this point, Maria's put some clothes in a bag. You have the cat? Yeah, yeah, I got her. Okay. Obviously, we don't want to be here anymore. Is the water going to keep coming up? Absolutely crazy scenes around Merritt right now. Evacuation alerts continue to roll out. All of Pine Street was underwater. Driving out was just the wildest feeling. The couple's new life together has become a race for survival. Plenty of rainfall is continuing to fall through the BC interior. Less than two days after the storm hits the coast, it's smashing into the mountains surrounding the Nicola Valley. And Dylan and Maria are on the run. Driving out was the wildest feeling, thinking, OK, this isn't just our street. It's actually the neighborhood. Absolutely crazy scenes around there right now. Local radio tells them just how big it is for their neighborhood. Everybody needs to leave who's in Colletville because the bridges are not going to be accessible for much longer. Then we were told to go check in with emergency services. As they make their way to check in, the town's flooding problems only deepen. Look at the river. It's coming right through Elwood's backyard. 
As soon as I saw the flooding begin in Merritt, I jumped in my car and I went there. Meteorologist Jacqueline Whittle heads right into the chaos. I'm seeing rocks and debris coming down some of these steep slopes. And it's giving me an unsettling feeling as I'm driving because what is Merritt going to look like? Merritt, BC is underwater. At the water treatment plant, Kevin and his crew have been fighting a losing battle. The water running around the treatment plant was about three and a half feet deep. You weren't able to walk through it without being swept away. Now, with flood water mixing into the wastewater. Oh, their poor new house. There's a whole new problem for the city. This is all basically water that has potentially raw sewage in it. Wastewater has also contaminated Merritt's freshwater supply. The potential for disease and bad bacteria would create a huge public health concern. It's not looking good. They need to close the valves that will cut off the water in all reservoirs and in the city's 72-kilometer pipe network over 9 million liters. Once we lost our water system, we didn't have any drinking water, and we had no fire protection. The entire city of Merritt is forced to evacuate. The nearly 7,000 residents were told to pack up and get out. The reason is, is because this water is toxic. You can see military-type equipment going through the streets of Merritt. People are being rescued from their homes. Everything you've worked for is being washed away, and you can't get to it. It's all flooded coming this way, and it's all underwater. Dylan and Maria have made their way through flooded streets to the community center. By the time we even drove into that parking lot, they said, no, it's full. You need to go to Kamloops. They'll need to drive 90 kilometers with no idea what they'll face at the other end. So now it's like, oh, well, are we going to go talk to Red Cross in Kamloops and be one of a few hundred people that needs to be put up for a little while? Or are we now part of 8,000 people? The couple finds a safe haven in Kamloops where they wade out the flood. For those on the Nicola River, 150 kilometers away, trouble is just beginning. When I got up in the morning, I noticed the river was pretty high. This is my pump house, folks. This is crazy stuff. The whole thing's sort of scary. If it wasn't so terrifying, it would be amazing. Stephen Rice documents the rising river. It's on the yellow line as we get the corner. Now consuming the highway. My first thought when I saw the river was like, holy crap, this is, you know, pretty bad. After a weekend getaway, off-duty police officer Brett Schmidt is trying to take Highway 8 home to Vancouver. I can see that the road is starting to chip away in some areas. And then I look in my rear view mirror, and I can see that about half of the road I was on has just fully collapsed. He's just outside Spence's bridge when he runs out of highway and leaves his car behind. This is so I was trapped. The road was completely gone. Perfect. Just what I needed. Within minutes, the Nicola River devours huge swaths of land, destroying properties. Oh, my dream! Oh. One of them is Kim Cardinals. The water came up really fast within five minutes. <laughs> I can hardly get back to my house. We were scrambling to get the animals out of the house. Come on, Maggie, had a girl. Kim and her husband raced to higher ground. There was water all around the house. 
Lauren grabbed the trailer and he put it on the very top of our driveway. As daylight fades and the highway crumbles, you can hear things collapsing around and you can hear boulders coming down the hill. Brett searches for a way out. I've seen a flashlight and the sky comes down that I've never seen before. Brett spots Kim sheltering in her trailer as water keeps rising nearby. I stop and ask her if she needs help or anything. With Lorne busy moving vehicles, Kim asks for help with her horses. I just have a feeling, and I walked over to where the horses were by the road. And Winter was pushing as hard as he could push against the fencing, like I never, ever seen him ever do. The horse's strange behavior tells Kim something is wrong. The water was starting to come into the part where the horses were. And then I thought, well, what's going on? Raging water is cutting under Kim's farm, pulling the land above into the river. Half that land was gone. And then all of a sudden, the house started to make like a screaming noise. Then it just disintegrated like in seconds. At any moment, the land under their feet could be next. And I said to my husband that I don't want to die. I was terrified, and I thought it was over. You're on my dream! Oh. The raging river has risen six meters, carving a new path and devouring Kim Cardinal's farm. I thought we were going to die because of the way the land had just disappeared. And I thought the piece of road that we were on was going to do the same thing. I was terrified, and I thought it was over. By dawn, the storm is over, and the river is receding. There's hope on the horizon. I was just so ecstatic when the daybreak came because you could see the river. It had done whatever it was going to do. But with the highway around them destroyed, there's no way out. Kim, Lorne, and Brett are trapped. It was kind of concerning. So we decided to build a fire as a smoke signal for anyone in the area. What I see right now up close is the road. <sighs> oh boy, the road is coming to an end. And basically, it was gone. It was just horrifying. The community's lifeline, Highway 8, collapsed in 18 places. It's been wiped out. As far as I can see, there's no road. You can't get out. Feel those trees that'll take that bridge out. Farther south, down the highway. I think Kite's Bridge could be in trouble. The remote community of Noach has lost one of just two bridges linking them to Merritt. We knew that one was gone, and we were watching the Petey Creek Bridge contemplating whether or not it was going to survive the flooding. Within a day, no H chief, Marcel Shackley, will see the remaining bridge give way. Just showing you how high the river is. I actually watched three people walking on the bridge. And less than a minute after they were off of the bridge, the bridge uh, fell into the river. That's a major. And the damage stretches far beyond Highway 8 throughout British Columbia. Major highways like the Coquihalla connecting the coast to the interior. 
are in ruins. So I'm just trying to get down to the Coquihalla for merit to cover this story, and I can't. The entire province had every major highway shut down. With temperatures dropping, the outlook is dire. The destruction has stranded thousands without food, power, or cell service. Of course, none of us knew what was going on in the outside world. Over the Nicola River, helicopter crews scan for any signs of life below. I heard a chopper, and I just came running out of that trailer, waving my arms. Well, two helicopters landed, and then the one took myself out of there, and then shortly after, Kim. I know. But as Kim prepares to depart, it's okay, baby. She'll be leaving her larger animals behind, <laughs> including Winter. And I was saying goodbye to them. And I said, I don't know if I'm going to have to let you loose. I knew the cougars and that would get them. Okay, ho, ho. I was hysterical. But her only hope is to take the flight to safety and try to help launch a rescue operation from outside the flood zone. After two long days, a chopper returns to Kim's farm. They found a lady that does horse rescue. They got a sling from a veterinarian, and I was told that this hasn't been done before, and they don't know the positive outcome of it. So be prepared. Stephen and other members of the community show up for moral support. They sedated the little ones, and they were able to get the mini horses out of there without much trouble. But the full-sized horse Winter! will be a much bigger challenge. Unfortunately, the sedation didn't work for Winter. <sighs> and his mask flew off. So Winter was fully aware of his flight. In Spence's Bridge, the plan to rescue Kim Cardinal's beloved horse <laughs> is coming in for a rough landing. Winter! As soon as his feet touched that ground, it just was like, he just went crazy. And then he tried to run, because he was now panicked. I just had a feeling they were going to have to shoot him. Kim moves in closer, trying to calm him down. When he came at me, I went, Winter, whoa, whoa, really loud. And he stopped. And I grabbed his halter and talked to him. And then the people came over very slowly and unhooked everything. Winter is alive and safe. Kim Good believes enough. that it was his warning that saved her own life. If it wasn't for Winter, myself, my husband, and the RCMP officer, Brett, would all be gone. Because he gave us the alert, didn't you? So I saved him, and he repaid the favor. Two weeks later, in Merritt. We're just climbing our berm that we put up to uh, prevent further flooding. The wastewater plant is back online. We incurred a lot of sediment and debris that came into the treatment plant. Our clarifiers had around 70 centimeters of silt built up in the bottom of them. We had to drain everything and clean every tank. It hasn't been easy. This flood was the worst nightmare for any operator. A lot of us were evacuated as well, so um, we also had to juggle that. 
those folks who have lost homes and have had flooding damage, we're all going to have to pinch in to rebuild Merritt. Some residents now return home to get a first look at a town that's been decimated. 366 homes remain on evacuation order in Merritt, and it's still unknown how many are salvageable. No silt and debris cover the streets. Dylan was smart enough to put this on because the mud is actually quite thick. Dylan and Maria are finally able to return to the home where they were starting their future together. Back into the house, you know, I haven't seen it since we left. There's just a bunch of silt and gravel and muck. This is our living room. You can see where the water was up to. Shock. You just come in there and you see your life completely turned upside down. A long journey to reclaim their home and life is just beginning. Wish us luck. Up and down the Nicola Valley, work to rebuild seven decimated bridges and several sections of highway is already underway. The roads were all torn up. It's an unprecedented event including the bridge that's a lifeline for the Noich community. The Noich Indian Band is 20 minutes away from Merritt. There's still no access through there at the moment. Highway 8 to Merritt saw the worst damage of any highway in BC. A lot of the work that we're doing right now is to get people access to their property, be able to get an access on Highway 8 right from Merritt to Spence's Bridge. And the repairs need to move quickly. With such unpredictable weather, there's concern that more flooding is on the way. We're trying to do things fast enough and do them at a level that when the snow starts melting and water comes up, it starts coming faster. Did we minimize some of the channels that are going to cause us problems again? There's still dangerous debris left behind in the river's path. If the thaw hits before construction is finished, the damage could be exponentially worse. The weather's been pretty strange this year. Um, when we started construction, it got very warm. With the warming temperatures, we're concerned about extreme snow melt above. To the south, the Coquihalla, one of the most important links to the west coast, has been torn apart. And logging started. Copy that. With a major thaw possible at any time, Repair crews turn to LIDAR to speed up repairs. Ready to power on? Ready for power on. Ready for launch? All right, we have navigation. Copy that. Each flight collects billions of points of data. Heading over to waypoint one now. Generating a precise roadmap for engineers. And that's going to define for them the shape and size of all the different washouts on the highways and the condition of all the bridges. In the race to rebuild major highways, every minute counts. Switching to auto. Without that LiDAR technology, the assessment of the damages would have taken four times as long. And we'd also still probably be repairing the highway for months. Directly over the mountains to the west, a landslide tore away 70 meters of Highway 1. It was almost like a war zone. Raj Sangha is overseeing the monumental task to build a bridge where a highway was washed away. 
This was entirely level. This crossing where the bridge is now, all this earth in this hole is what moved. When the washout happened, we were working seven days a week, uh, almost 24 hours a day, trying to plan for how we were going to get this open. The steep terrain and narrow workspace give rise to an innovative approach. It's put together almost like, like pieces of Lego, where each of these members are put together individually and then bolted on together with a crane lifting a piece in place and then assembling it together in sections. We didn't have enough space. We actually built half of the bridge in place, launched it, and then built the other half. Like many of the early responses, it's literally a stopgap measure with permanent repairs in the works. But the big question, how to prepare for the next disaster before it happens? There are crews everywhere doing the same kind of work, trying to assess, but they can't give us firm dates on anything, really, on when these roads will be open. After the biggest natural disaster in Canadian history, Dozens of communities across southwestern BC are planning their comeback. But for many, the question is where to even begin. After being part of a flood and a disaster and just seeing the actual definition of like human migration, it just makes you realize that it's not, if this will happen again, it's more of when will this happen again and how do we all adapt to that? One of the keys to understanding the risks for tomorrow. Beyond the dreams of his ancestors, modern man has molded the earth to his liking. Is looking to the past. When you think about what humans have been able to do, it's pretty amazing. We've been able to move water in ways that we've never been able to do in the past. Vivek Shandas is an expert on climate adaptation. We tend to see an event happen and we say, how can we put technology in front of that? How can we hard engineer our way out of that? The globe is studded with some impressive examples of this kind of engineering. Like the Delta Works in Holland, the Thames Barrier in London, or Tokyo's vast network of subterranean tunnels, tanks, and pillars that can withstand a shocking 17 million tons of water. When I think about the way that humans have thought about nature during big engineering, one of the things that was very prominent was humans' ability to dominate nature. While there are some modern engineering masterpieces, most of our infrastructure are relics of a different time. Much of this infrastructure is designed on the historic norm, yet those design standards are not equipped to be able to manage some of the things coming down the pike. But in the chaos... Hey, Rob, where are we at with the combo? Engineer and flood management specialist Tamsin Lyle sees a way forward. We've had this big event, and we also have all of this infrastructure that's not really working for us anymore. So this is really our opportunity to do things differently. And that could mean leaving behind some of the hard engineering of the past. Hard engineering is the things that we classically think engineers build. Big buildings, big dikes, lots of rock, lots of grave. But we can also look at a different way of th doing things that's more green. So we can look at how nature has done things and bring these two things together. We don't have to just default to hard infrastructure, hard walls to keep water out. There are opportunities to build with nature, to use ecosystems such as wetlands to protect communities from flooding. There are alternatives to your traditional hard armored approaches. Around the world, soft engineering is beginning to take root with more green in urban areas reforesting land to stabilize riverbanks and shorelines, and sponge cities built to absorb, store, and purify rainwater. It's all part of a shift in thinking. 
I think what brings me hope for the future after this event is if we continue to have these discussions about how we could be doing things better, there is hope that eventually we will start doing things better. 4,000 kilometers east of Merritt, plans are underway to rewild the mouth of a river in Canada's largest city. What we're doing is widening the river here to provide more flood volume for the water. The work that we're doing is one of the largest civil engineering projects ever undertaken in the city of Toronto. Replacing century-old concrete, the new landscape is designed to divert excess water onto floodplains and then back into Lake Ontario. In terms of the amount of work we're doing and the type of work we're doing, this is very, very innovative. There are very few examples uh, globally of the kind of work that we're doing here. But at the western end of the country, the priority is still repairing essential roads and bridges. Nine months after the flood, some of Kim's neighbors are finally heading home on a partially rebuilt Highway 8. We are on our first official drive home to the farm. For Kim, the hunt is on to find a new place to live. I've always wanted to live in the desert area. She hopes to stay in Spence's Bridge with the community that has been with her through thick and thin. I can see the potential. The only thing we're missing is the river. In Merritt. This is where the water came to. You can still see the debris that got stuck in the fence. After fighting their way back from one tragedy, Gross. Dylan and Maria are ready to fight again. Watch all the overgrown grass. I think we spent three or four days basically demolishing everything inside the house. So honestly, kind of like good to have something we can do. You know, like we felt like we were making progress, right? This could be a home again. But in the end, the damage was just too much. It's weird being here. It's weird being here at night. I really like Merritt. I like the path that our life was on, but you never know what's going to happen, and who knows what the future looks like. Oh, boy. That's going to fall. They do know they'll find out together. If I had to go through both things, I'm happy that I got to go with Dylan, because he just really was like a rock through all of it, and is still a very, very steady rock, steady hand. I really don't know what I would have done without her, because it's just, it's a lot. The last year has taught me that anything can be thrown at you, and there's no rhyme or reason to who gets affected by what. I do think that the biggest thing we have control over is the compassion that everybody has towards each other during these hard times and how we all bounce back from it. The there's tulips just... were growing here. <laughs> We're like, ah, life finds a way. <laughs> it's been months since the river took Kim's house. It was terrifying what happened, but I don't hate the river. Respect it, but I don't want to live by one again. She's found a new home, still close to her community, but away from the water. So Lauren and I just actually became the owners of this piece of land, and it's 2.2 acres. Plenty enough room for my horses. This is where we're going to make a new home. Once we get living here, We'll have a play set set up for the grandkids. We're still here. We're still in town. We're still in Spence's Bridge, the desert line. And I feel blessed and lucky to have that.